So now that we've got the basics of logic down, we're going to go into the more interesting stuff, which is how do I reason in a very formal way? How do I make, how do I make logical arguments? And, and some of this will just make sense to your gut, even without learning it formally. So, you know, for example, suppose I say, if it rains today, I will get wet. For whatever reason, I know that. Maybe I spend all my time outside and I have no waterproof equipment, but whatever. If it rains today, I will get wet. And then I say, it is going to rain today. Well, what's the obvious conclusion? The obvious conclusion is, I'm going to get wet. And this form of reasoning um, is actually a very logical, straightforward form of reasoning, and it has a name, which is called modus ponens. And effectively, if I know it's that A implies B, right? I know that's true, and I also know that A is true, then, of course, I can conclude B. And so here's a list of lots of different um, inference rules, proof rules, logical things that really make sense if you look at them closely. So the one we were talking about so far is modus ponens. That's down here. And the way you read these rules is if I know everything above the line, it kind of looks like a fraction, all these, right? Then I can conclude whatever's below the line. So for example, in modus ponens, it says if I know that A is true, and I know that A implies B is true, then I also know that B is true, right? Then I can conclude that B is true. I can infer that B is true. So let's just go through these rules and um, confirm that they kind of make sense to us, right? So there's first, the first rule up here is the conjunction rule, right? You remember that conjunction is the fancy word for and. And this says if I know A is true and I know B is true, then it's reasonable to conclude. Remember, I know what's true above the line. I can conclude what's the below the line. If I know A is true, I know B is true. It's completely reasonable to conclude that the conjunction of A and B is also true, right? A and B is also true. Um, and there's kind of conjunctions um, partner, I don't know what you want to call it, um, is called simplification. If I know that A and B are if I know that the statement A and B is true, well, it's totally reasonable to assume that A is true too, right? To conclude, to infer, not really assume, right? If I know A and B is true, then I know that A must be true because I know how and works. Similarly, if I know A and B is true, I also know that B must be true, right? Because and is only true. This whole A and B thing can only be true if both the pieces of it are true. So that's simplification. Um, now we'll talk about addition. Addition is used um, with or. So suppose that I know that A is true. Well, if A is true, then I can conclude that A or anything else is true, right? Because or just requires one thing to be true. So if A is true, I can conclude that A or B is true. Similarly, if A is true, I can conclude that B or A is true. Does that make sense? I hope so. Um, because B or A, for example, right, is true if one of these two things are true, right? If one or both, one or the other or both, that's or. Um, and since I know that one is true, I can conclude that. So that's addition. addition. Um, moving right along, we've got disjunctive syllogism. Whew, that's a mouthful. And in fact, many of these are mouthfuls. And that's why we've got these abbreviations to the right. The book even gives us these abbreviations. Um, and those are the abbreviations we're going to use in our proof, uh, in our proofs. Um, and so, um, disjunctive syllogism makes sense. Um, look at this. If I know that the woof A or B is true, and I also know that not A is true, in other words, A is false, well, then the only thing I can conclude is B must be the true thing in this A or B, right? And then its partner, if A or B is true, but B is false, right, not B, then A must be, um, then I can conclude A must be the true thing. By the way, you should be, I mean, I'm drawing this on the slide, I'm writing all over it, I'm messing it all up, but you should have downloaded from the class web website already 
a piece of paper that has um, these proof rules and also actually some additional derived rules. We're not going to worry about those additional rules for now, but please, if you haven't already, pause this video and download that sheet of proof rules because after the slide you're going to need it. You're going to want to refer to it anyway. Okay. Continuing on, we've already talked about modus ponens. Um, next one is conditional proof, right? So if I start with A and I take a series of logical steps and end up knowing that B is true, then I can conclude that A implies B. Okay? That's probably the, the well, one of the hardest ones. The other, the other hard one would be this indirect proof, right? Um, which is, if I start with not A, in other words, if I assume not A, and given that assumption, I can derive false. I can conclude that false is true, right? If I assume that not A is true, and, I, and, and so A is false, and I can conclude that false is true, um, then this not A must have been wrong, and I can conclude this A, right? That's proof by contradiction, right? If I assume the opposite and I come up with a contradiction, it must be true, all right? Um, and, and that's called indirect proof. It's not called contradiction. We have something else called contradiction right here. Um, and contradiction is if I know that A is true and I also know that not A is true, then there's something wrong with the world, and I can conclude false is true. All right? And then there's the easiest one, probably, of all of these, which I've left till last, double negation, which is if I know not not A, right? If I know that, then I can conclude A, right? And if I know A, I can conclude not not A. And and we'll see how we'll see how we use these in a minute. It it, it if it's still a little bit weird about what do you mean if I know this, I can conclude that? I can use these rules to do proofs. So let's keep going and I'll show you where we are. Getting much more formal about proofs, we have just a couple of definitions. We have an axiom, which is something we know to be true. That's like a world truth, right? And a proof is going to be just a bunch of woofs that are in order. And each woof is either going to be an axiom, or we can infer it given the previous woofs in our sequence. Okay? And the last woof in our proof is called a theorem. It's something we've proven. And we're going to use the standard proof notation that, that you should expect. We're going to put, you know, a number, and then we're going to have our woof, and then we'll have a reason, and then we'll have a number, and we'll have a woof, and we'll have a reason. Um, and if our reason is it's an assumption, it's a premise, then we'll use the letter P. Otherwise, we'll use the letters in our inference rules. And at the very end of our proof, after we've had a bunch of these lines, we will write QED to show that we know we're done. So here's our first problem. Um, it says prove D given the following premises, and we have three premises here. Okay? So Assume this stuff. If this stuff is true, can you conclude D? So I've put the outline of our proof here. All right, oops, with the QED below it too. Right? The outline of our proof says, well, lines one, two, and three are obvious. They're going to be our premises, right? Our assumptions. One, two, and three. So I wrote, you know, I copied this premise. Um, and I copied it down here, and then I wrote P because it's a premise, and I copied this one down here, and I wrote P, and I copied this one down here. So my first three lines of my proof are just a bunch of premises, right? And I also, just so we can see it, I've put in tiny little form um, the inference rules up here in the corner, um, but you may find it helps to uh, have that sheet printed out. Um, so let's move up so we have a little bit of space. And this is another another case of these, you know, using your wits. It's a pain, but you just got to figure it out. We're trying to conclude D, right? We're trying to get to D. Um, and so when I look at this, look at this. I have A or C implies D right up here at the top, right? 
That's the only place I have a D. Um, and so I'm going to have to do something so that I can um, get, get that D out of there. And if you look at the rule for modus ponens, right, if I have something implies something, right, and remember that the rules of precedence implies has the lowest precedence, so the parentheses are going to be like that, um, then what I, need to, what I need to do in order to use this modus ponens rule is I, I need to have, well, I already have A or C implies D, so if I could just get A or C, that first part, right, then I could prove it. So I want to get that A or C part. Um, and I don't see any C's anywhere else, so that's kind of hopeless. But I do have A or B. So, and, and I'm sure that you can kind of, at some level, see, see how this is working in your head, right? Because if you look, this is, this is a pretty, uh, as proofs go, this one is simple. But I wanted to show you a simple one first. So if we look at this, what you'll notice is I have not B, right? And I have A or B. Um, and if I want to get that A out of there, if I want to get an A out of an OR, again, I kind of look at what are my inference rules? Hmm. Well, I need to say where do I have an OR at the top and something at the bottom that gives me just one piece of that, right? And sure enough, if I look at these guys, right, for disjunctive syllogism, I see that if I know A or B, and I also know not B, I can conclude A. That's fabulous. So we're going to have line 4 be A, the reason is going to be DS, and it's DS from lines, let's see, we used lines 2 and 3, right? So now I know A, but I need to know A or C, not just A. So again, i got to look at my rules and say, what the heck can I do? I'm starting out with an A, but I want to get something that is of the form A or something else. So at the top, i got to have an A, and at the bottom, i got to have an OR. So I'm just kind of looking at these guys, saying, who has an OR at the bottom? And the only one that has an OR at the bottom is this one. And it says, look, if I already know A, I can conclude B or A. And of course, I can also conclude Q or A, right? We're just lucky this first example, we're using the same letters. So um, if I know A, I can conclude A or B, right? So, you know what, if I know A, I can conclude A or C using this rule too, right? So my line 5 is going to be A or C, right? And what's my reasoning for that? Well, my reasoning is this addition rule. Oops, sorry. My reasoning is this addition rule, um, and I used line 4, right? And I think we're good now because we know A or C implies D, so now I can do that modus ponens, right? So this is actually, it fits beautifully. Line 6, I'm going to say, now I can conclude D. How can I conclude D? Well, I can conclude D based on modus ponens and um, lines, let's see, it's line 1 and line 5. Okay? Now, one thing that I will say, you know, I'm, I'm saying take a look at my rules and, and say who starts with this, who ends with this. Um, you know, if you're trying to do a very complicated proof, these tricks aren't going to help you too much. On the other hand, I'm going to give you mostly medium complicated proofs for the purposes of this class, right? This is not a, a, um, a full semester of logic. So you know, just kind of thinking about how can I get from here to there, becoming very familiar with these, these proof rules and really kind of understanding how they work will get you very far with most of these proofs. And here you go. Here's my proof. Um, you'll notice that this is just written out neatly so you can actually read it. You'll notice that um, here I put the line numbers before the reason, and on the previous page I put the reason before the line numbers. doesn't really matter. Both are fine. Okay, so let's do another proof. Um, again, it's telling us here's what you want to prove, and here's your premise. Okay, so here we go, and again, I've given you, um, you know, the premise. It says given the premise A and D, so I put the premise here. I've put what we want to prove at the very bottom, followed by QED, but I don't know what line number that's going to be on. I don't know what reasons I'm going to use yet. Though my best guess is I'm going to be using reasons from in there from that sheet that I gave you. Um, 
so let's see uh, what we can do here. Um, if I look at where I'm trying to get to, right? Um, and just like with the previous set of slides, sometimes you can't do this linearly. Sometimes you can't do this um, in just one long proof. For this one, again, it's reasonably easy, so we sort of can. Um, if I look at this, you know, I've got the A up here and the A on the left side here and the D up here and the D on the right side here. So it seems to me I'm going to have to split up these A and D, right? Because I don't have an A and D down here. I have an A or B and it with a C or D. So I want to split that up. So I need to find a rule over here that says, well, I'm starting with an and above the line and I can conclude individual things below the line, right? Um, and if I look around, it looks like that's my simplification rule, right? And in fact, I can pull out both pieces using that simplification rule. So, you know, I can say line 2, if I know A and D, I can conclude A based on line 2 and simplification. But it's also the case that if I know A and D, oops, that should be based on line 1, right? Um, and if I know A and D on line 1, I can also conclude D from line 1 and simplification. Um, so now I have the A's and the, the, well, the A and the D separate, but I actually need A or B, right? Not just plain old A. So now maybe I'm looking for something that has an or on the bottom. And, you know, of course, if you look around at our rules again, you'll see that this addition rule here uh, fits the bill very nicely, right? Because I can start with A and end up with A or whatever I want. In this case, A or B. In fact, that's exactly what it says in here. So let's do that. So we'll say um, A or B based on line 2 and addition. Um, and we also need that C or D down here. Right, which I can do again from the addition rule using the second part of the addition rule. Um, so uh, line three, right, is my D. So I could say five is, um, let's see, C or D based on line three and addition. Um, and check it out. If I have something and I want to, if I know two things and I want to and them together, right, I still need to have an and at the very end. Well, look at our old friend conjunction, right? Um, if I know A and I know B, then I can conclude A and B, which is what I'm doing here. I know A or B, I know C or D, so I can conclude the conjunction of the two of them. So this is in fact line six. And the reason is from lines four and five combined using conjunction, okay? And you can, of course, use all of those equivalency rules um, that we had on that first sheet you printed out for the last lecture, too. So if there's something that you need, like suppose you have um, D or C and you really need C or D, well, of course, you can conclude C or D because D or C is equivalent to C or D, right, because uh, of the um, equivalence rules. So you can u also use your rules, those rules in these proofs with the same reasoning, that the same reasons that we um, that we listed on the on the sheet. Um, so the same abbreviations. And so here's that proof um, written out, except there's a typo in it, isn't there? Because this is actually based on line three and addition. Um, and uh, there's your proof. <laughs> Written out mostly nicely. So let's talk about a sort of a trick um, to prove that something is a tautology. Remember what a tautology is, is, um, is uh, it's a statement that is always true no matter what values, um, of what true-false values you give for A and B in a, um, in a truth table, right? Um, and so here's how you can prove that a implies B is a tautology if you assume that A is your premise and you can prove B, right, without using CP or IP. This is important. So without using that um, conditional proof or indirect proof um, reasoning along the way. I'll, I'll, we'll go into more of this in, in more detail later about how 
when you can and can't use CP or IP. But for now, if you assume A and you can prove just plain old B without using any of that, then you can have a final line. Um, and here I've written that just says QED, but really that says A implies B, right? And then you got your QED, but your reason will be CP and all the lines that come before. Um, let me show you an example. So here's what we just proved, complete with typo. All right. And I just want to show you that how we could use this to prove that this piece implies this piece. And you can see to do that, we take um, our old proof and then just add one more line, right? Which says A and D implies A or B, right? Our premise implies that thing on line six, right? Um, and then our reason is we say it's all of lines one to six using conditional proof. Now here's a weird warning about conditional proof that I'm not going to explain for a minute. So you're just going to have to be like, yeah, right. I totally don't get what you just said, but I'm going to warn you now and then I will explain to you. So the first thing I just want to point out before I warn you, so ignore that warning for a second, is it's very important to notice that this says lines one through six. It's not just line one and six, it's one through six. Okay. Um, but here's the warning and it will make sense soon. If you use conditional proof for a proof, right, then when you have used the, the CP rule, the conditional proof, we say that your premise is discharged and you're using all those rules all those lines that start with the premise, anything that you used based on that or based on subsequent conclusions from that through your CP um, as your reason. So for example, here it's lines one through six, right? Because all of these are based on our start out of, of A and D. Um, and I'll explain why this is important later, but for now just say, oh, that means it's discharged. I don't know what discharge means, but interesting. So here's another example of something you need to prove. Um, and pretty much any time you need to prove something like this that has lots of pieces to it um, that are connected by ands. So like here, we've got this piece and this piece. Oops, sorry. This piece and this piece, right? And we're trying to prove that this is a tautology, right? So we know we're going to use that conditional proof rule in the end, right? Because it's an implies. Um, but whenever you have a premise, right? And, and so since we're using this conditional proof rule, we're going to assume the left-hand side of the implication is a premise. And, um, and at the very end, we hope that we'll have a line that looks like this with our reasoning will be because of conditional proof. Um, but whenever you have something with lots of ands in it as a premise, the first thing to do, um, or the next step to do before you do anything else really, um, other than to give yourself slightly more room by moving the slide up a little bit, is to, uh, is to conclude each of those individual parts, um, using the simplification rule. Simplification is your friend, right? If you know that there's some stuff anded together, you can just take all those different pieces. So let's do that because they may help us. So we can say A or C implies D, right? And that's from line one and simplification. And we can take the next piece, which is the not B, and that's from line one again and simplification, right? And we can take that last one, which is a or B, and that's from line one and simplification. So that's step one is just do that because it gives you lots of good stuff. And if you're taking a quiz or something, it, it gives you something to write. Uh, okay, so now let's look at what we're trying to do. We're trying to conclude D. And again, I'm going to try and sort of break this apart. I have a something implies D, right? So I need to try and get um, an A or C, right? Because if I can get an A or C like here, right? So if I could come up with A or C in there somewhere, then I could say, then I could conclude D based on the, um, based on line two and whatever line number this one turns out to be, 
right? So that'll be based on two and something. Um, and uh, let's see if I know A or C, which is the rule? Help me out here. So I know A or C implies D, and I want to just get the D out. So what has an arrow on the top? I'm really hoping you've already figured this out, right? So it's modus ponens. So that's going to be um, line two and some other line, whatever the line of immediately above me and modus ponens. So I'm trying to get A or C. Um, and look at this. So do you see where we are? I've got this um, A or B here. And I also know not B. Oh, isn't that interesting, right? If I know not B and I know A or B, well, I could pull out the A part, right? Um, because where is it over here? Hello, where's my rule? Um, here we go. Disjunctive syllogism, right? So if I know A or B and I know not A, or I know A or B and I know not B, right? So I know A or B, I know not B. Um, that sounded kind of funny, didn't it? So I can say, I can conclude A based on line three and four and disjunctive syllogism, right? Um, and I think we're good now. I think that makes this line six, right? Because if I know A, um, then I can use the addition rule, right, over here to turn it into A or something else, right? So I'll turn it into A or C. And that'll be based on line five and my addition rule. And so that means I can conclude D based, this is line seven, based on lines two and six in modus ponens. And so line eight, the end of my proof is this thing based on, let's see, so we're using the CP rule again. So it's gonna be based on all the lines ahead of it. So it's gonna be one to seven CP. And here it is written out a little bit more cleanly. A couple things to note about this example. The first is that the book gets really lazy. And, and the truth is the book is lazy because the author's done a lot of proofs. And when you've done a lot of proofs, if, if someone asks you to prove that one thing implies another and that one thing has a bunch of ands in it, um, people generally leave out the first step. And what, what the book does is the book just leaves out line one, and then it says that um, this is a premise, and this is a premise, and this is a premise, which I don't love. I really think if what you're trying to do is prove that if you start with this, you can conclude this, then you should put in this left-hand side as your premise and go from there, because that's really the way that conditional proof works, right? Um, the other thing that the book does is the book says, oh, you know, sometimes with these conditional proofs, the last line can get so full, I don't want to write out all this stuff, right? And again, it's kind of, it's laziness that apparently I don't approve of, I'm not quite sure why, but so the book, instead of doing that, the book writes QED here and leaves out the QED there, but I, I, I really don't love that either. I, I like it the way we've done it, um, so I encourage you to do it the way I showed you on the previous slide. In other words, here's my proof again. I think this is beautiful. I think this is the way you should do it. Okay, yet another um, example that uses CP. So um, here's what we want to prove. And onto our scratch page, I've put, um, you know, our, our chart of of standard proof rules. I've said this has to be my premise if I'm trying to use CP, so that's my premise. And I've written out the whole thing at the bottom. I know I'm gonna use CP, but I don't know what lines I'm gonna use yet. Um, and I'm gonna do, you know, my standard uh, first step, which is let's just use the simplification rule. Can't find it, here we go, the simplification rule. Um, to split up all these bits that are anded together. Now you have to be careful here um, with the precedence, right? So so I can say, um, oops, that's not a pen. A or B implies C and D, right? That's one piece. That's my first piece because that's in parentheses. Let's see if I can make this a little bit bigger so I have a little bit more room. I'm afraid you're going to lose your rules, um, but um, hopefully you printed out the sheet, right? 
Um, okay, and then the next piece, the next, um, oh, and sorry. Um, and, of course, the reason for that is line one and simplification. And we'll do the same thing for that A, which is line one and simplification. And the same thing for that C implies E. That's line one and simplification. Now we'll look at the problem and say, what is it I'm trying to do? I'm trying to get to, um, at the very bottom, I want D and E, right? That's what I need to conclude. So I guess this line here is going to have D and E, right? So that I can use CP for, for the very last step. Um, so it's going to be, you know, line one to whatever the heck this line turns out to be. Um, and if I want D and E, well, let's look. If I'm, if I'm looking, you know, in order to conclude D and E, I need both of these things. Um, by both of these things, I mean I need to have both D and E, right? So I'm kind of looking up here and I'm saying, well, there's my D. Um, and how do I get that D out? Well, it's on the right-hand side of an implies, so I probably, you know, need to have that A or B. And how can I get that A or B? Well, I have an A. Okay, here we go, right? So we're going to use exactly the same tricks we've used um, a couple of times before, right? Um, I can come up with A or B, right? Because I know A. So A or B um, is just, um, uh, let's see, addition, right? So if I know A, I can conclude from line 3 and addition A or B. Um, and now that I know A or B, um, I can use line 2 to conclude C and D from the simplification rule. Um, or sorry, from modus ponens, right? Um, and so I knew, right, so I knew A or B, so that using modus ponens, if I know A or B and I know this, then I can conclude the back end of it. So I can conclude C and D um, based on line two and line five. And modus ponens. All right, and where are we going? We're trying to get to D, D and E, right? Well, I know C and D. Oh, okay, look. I know C and D, um, and I'm trying to get D and E. So if I pull out the C, then modus ponens will give me the E. And I can pull out the D on its own. Um, so so let's do that. If I So line 7... Um, I can say that I've got C just based on line 6 in simplification. And now that I've got that, I can get E. Oops, that's not E, that's line 8. Um, let's see, can I make this bigger yet again? There we go. I hope you like the sound effects. Um, doesn't give me a huge amount of room, but anyway, we'll keep going. Um, 8 would be, I wanted to get that E out of there based on, let's see, this one, 4 and 7 in modus ponens, and modus ponens, and um, let's see, so I have E, but I need D and E, so I need to get D, so let's kind of add to our proof a bit in red for a second, so um, I got to get D by itself, right, which I can get from line 6, right? So let's do, what are we up to, line 9? Um, I can conclude D based on line 6 and simplification, right? Um, and if I know D and I know E, then I can do D and E. So, so now we're back kind of in our proof, right? So this will be line 10, will be my D and E, and I can do that um, by conjunction, Right. Um, if I can join, let's see, what am I conjuncting? Um, the D and the E, so that'll be lines 8 and 9. What color am I writing now? Here we go, 8 and 9. And conjunction, and then here we are with line 11, which is we conclude the whole thing. Um, and now i got to shrink it a little bit so you can see my reasoning. 
So 11 is now lines 1 to 10 and CP. And check it out, we have another little typo in there. Um, but uh, there's my reasoning, right? Okay, one more trick. Um, not really a trick, but one common thing you can do if you want to prove that some woof is true, right? A woof is a, woof is a tautology, it's always true. Um, and I guess maybe I said this earlier, is, is you start with not woof as your premise. Um, and you're going to prove false, you're going to prove your contradiction without using CP or IP. Um, and I'll explain later what's going on there. It's, it's that discharge thing again. Then, magic, you can use IP to conclude um, your woof is true. Right, and I said before, IP is proof by contradiction, right? If you assume not A and you end up with false, right? You're saying that false is true. Um, then the only way you can do that is with a nice contradiction, so you can conclude A. So let's do an example. Um, let's prove that this statement here, this wolf, sorry, not statement, um, is a tautology, right? It's not the case that A and not A. That's always going to be true no matter what value you use for A. So as a reminder, I said we're going to use um, IP rule, right, the indirect proof rule, um, to prove this, which means that we need to start out by assuming that our statement is false, right, when we were doing our proof by um, contradiction, right? So if we want to assume that this thing is false, then we got to put a not around this thing. So that's what we're going on here. So line one of our proof is going to be it's not the case that this thing, right? And that'll be our premise, right? So here you go. We're going to start out with that as our premise, and we're going to conclude the statement based on IP, and it'll be lines one through something, right? Okay. So um, let's take a look at this. Um, you know, if you look at it, we have that double negative at the beginning, and so let's just get rid of that, because I like getting rid of double negatives whenever possible. So I'm going to say that's A and not A, right, um, by line 1 and double negation. Sorry I didn't put the uh, rules on this slide. Um, I hope you've printed them out. You should print them out, right? Um, and what are we trying to do? We're trying to conclude false, right? And and um, the only rule, if you look at our inference rules, that gives you um, false on the bottom half is contradiction, right? Which looks something like this. It's got A. If you know A and you also know not A, then you can conclude false. Right? Um, and we're in the fortunate situation now that you see that rule. Hopefully everything makes sense. Because um, what I'm going to do is, I guess down here at the bottom, whatever line this is, I'm hoping I'll have a false there, right? Um, and so all I need to do is conclude A, and I also need to conclude not A. And fortunately, that simplification rule that we've been using a gazillion times a day will really help us. So line 3 is just going to say, well, I know A is true because we have the and with an A in it. So that's based on line 2 and simplification. And similarly, not A is true based on line 2 and simplification. But look, um, we now know that false is true based on lines um, 3 and 4 and that contradiction rule. And so that means that line 6 of our proof um, can simply say that... Um, from lines 1 to 5 using IP, we can conclude um, that the opposite of our, um, of our assumption is true, right? So, so from not A, so, so uh, again, the um, indirect proof rule is if from, I didn't write an F, did it? From not A, you can derive false, 
then you can conclude A. So that's what we did. We started with not of this piece. We derived false, and so now we just have that piece, and our reasoning is IP. Um, indirect proof, and again, it's lines 1, 2, 5, not just lines 1 and 5, but 1 hyphen 5. And there is the pretty version of this thing written out. And it's um, worth pointing out that after um, an IP, an indirect proof, um, in the same way as after a CP conditional proof, um, this premise is discharged. I haven't explained what that means yet, but it is discharged. And also the book, if you look at the proofs in the book, they'll write QED here, um, allegedly to save space, but I just write the whole conclusion out. I prefer that. So at this point, you're probably pretty fed up with me talking about this discharge uh, thing without explaining it. Um, and it all has to do with more complicated proofs, that is, proofs that have subproofs in them. So let's talk about subproofs. First, I'll kind of give you the, the overview. A subproof is just a proof that's part of another proof. Um, and a subproof always starts with a premise and ends by having either a CP or an IP on the result. And, and once you've done that, the premise is discharged, right? And the woofs in that derivation become inactive. What you want to think is local variable, okay? A subproof may introduce some local variables in if you're if you're talking kind of Java language, right? It's like a code block. And the local variables that you introduce, the things that you do in that code block, when you leave the code block, they're no longer there. Okay? Um, and we are actually, as we write our subproofs, we're going to indent um, the statements of the subproof. So it really is going to look like a code block. Um, and then we'll write down the result of the CP or the IP without indentation. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look at an example with me in a minute and then come back and look at this slide again and say, oh yeah, okay, I get what she means now. So here's here's kind of a rough outline of what I mean, right? So you're working on your proof and you have your woof and your, say it's a premise and another woof and some reason. I mean, W1 doesn't have to necessarily be a premise, but probably is, right? W, your second woof and your third woof, and you got all this good stuff, right? Um, and then we're going to start our subproof. And how do I know I start the subproof here? Well, I know because I did it out on scratch paper first, okay? Um, so that's the trick. You, you only use uh, subproofs when you have um, you've worked it out. Oh, yeah, I need this piece. Oh, that's a subproof. Okay, let me indent. All right, so I have another woof that's a premise. I got a bunch of stuff, right? Um, and notice that, that like line 5, um, I can use line 1 through 4. Line 6, I can use lines 1 through 5. Line 7, I can use lines 1 through 6. But as soon as I outdent, right, so if I'm thinking in Java terms, I leave the code block, right, because I've got a CP, right? This says I used rules 4 to 7 and CP, lines 4 to 7 and CP. Then once we get here, I can't use... Um, as any of my reasons, lines 4 through 7 anymore, right? Because use of the CP discharges the premise on line 4, and from this point on, you can't use lines 4 to 7 as reasons in your proof. And again, we're just thinking code block. So by the time I get to this wolf 9 on line 9, right, I can use any reason I want that comes from lines 1 through 3 or line 8, but I cannot use lines 4 through 7 because they're kind of in this sub-block, right? Similarly, line 10 can use anything above it except 4 to 7. And um, and then I'm doing this in, in sort of the book notation where I put QED at the bottom um, instead of writing what it is I'm trying to conclude. But then this will be a, a CP or an IP maybe, um, but only using lines 1 to 3 and 8 to 10 again. So I kind of do some work in this code block that results in a line that's on my main... My main um, path, as it were. Um, but the stuff that I do in there, I don't get to see. You know, maybe it's a code block, maybe it's a, it's a separate method. However, however, it makes it feel better for you. Again, this may still not be clear. Let me show you an example or two, and hopefully that will make it crystal clear. Okay. Oops, sorry. Before I show you an example, 
Um, let me just say that that we can do exactly the same thing if you're using IP, right? So 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 um, down here at the bottom it says CP or IP. I guess on this slide it really should just say IP, and on the previous one just CP. So let's look at a real example. Let's suppose I want to prove this um, wolf up at the top. Um, so we'll get started in our same old standard way. Um, by the way, I assume you see here that because we have the implication that the parentheses go around there, right? That's the precedence. So I'm going to assume because, you know, my last line is going to be something like um, A implies B and A or B implies B and that'll be from some application of um, conditional proof. I don't know quite how yet, but that's where we're going, right? Um, and so we use the same old starters that we always do. We say, well, I know A implies B and A or B, um, right? I know the left side, um, and so I will say that's a premise. There we go. Um, and we'll do that simplification that I like to do. So we'll say now we know A implies B, and that's from line one and a simplification, and we'll say A or B, and that's from line two and a simplification. Okay, so that's all fine. Um, but now we start doing our old trick of saying, oh, it's nice and easy whenever Dr. K gives us these proofs. Um, we just kind of look, and I want to conclude B, so I need to pull B out somewhere. Um, and you look and you say, huh, I can't really pull B out of that one. And I can't pull B out of that one. I mean, our normal way would say, oh, look, I could pull B out of that one if only I know A. But I don't know A, do I? Right? Um, and so we got to do, we have to do something a little bit, um, trickier. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to try and say, all right, well, let me, let me do kind of a little bit of, of extra scratch work. What if I, I want to get B, right? B is, 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 um, is, is what I want to conclude, right? Um, and so... Maybe I can do that if I assume not B and then use indirect proof. Um, except if I do that, um, then all that work that I do for that is going to is gonna um, be um, uh, discharged, right? So I'm not going to be able to use it in my main sort of blue piece of the proof. So I'm going to erase that little red box there, but I'm going to do this, this little extra work in here. So let's just say, what would happen if for line four, right, um, and really you don't usually, maybe I should undo that, you don't, you don't usually um, indent your line numbers. So for line four, what if I assumed not B, right, if I assumed not B, and that would, I guess, be a premise, right? And notice I'm indenting here, right? Um, could I get anything if I know not B? Well, look at this. Um, if I know not B, right, then now I can I can use line three, right? And I can say, ah, well, um, with line three and, um, and that not B, so um, with line three and line four, um, if I use that uh, disjunctive syllogism, right, um, the DS rule, I can get A out of there, right? So, so um, my line 5 is going to say, boy, well, if I know not B, right, if I assume not B, then from line 3 and line 4 and DS, and I hope you have your sheet in front of you, I can conclude A, right? Because if I know A or B is true and I know not B is true, well, then the A part must be true. Um, and now it gets kind of fun, because look, if I know A, now I could use line 2 and modus ponens um, to get the, the right side of that line, right? If I know A and I know A implies B, I can get B with modus ponens. 
so I could write down B here, which is using lines, let's see, a two and five and modus ponens. Um, ah, but now comes the fun part, right? Um, I know not B, and I also know B. Um, so if I know not B and I know B, I can use contradiction to conclude false. And that's based on lines four and six and um, that contradiction rule. Um, and so now, look at this. I assumed something, right? I assumed the opposite of something. I assumed not B. I went through a bunch of lines and concluded false. So this is exactly where indirect proof comes, right? From not A derive false, right? Then you can conclude A. So from all of this stuff, I can, and I'm going to outdent now, and I'm, I'm indicating that with my, with my um, color here too, though normally in a proof you just use one color, I can conclude B, all right? And my reason is going to be indirect proof, but it's going to be lines 4 through 7 and indirect proof. And now in any other lines of my proof that I do in here, hopefully I can squish them in before I... Uh, get to there, um, I can't use anything that's in red, right, because it's been discharged. That red stuff, it was in a sub-block, it was in a method, however you want to think of it, I can't use that stuff anymore, right? So I can't use the fact that not B might be true. Well, of course I can't use the fact that not B might be true. I assumed it and it was wrong, right? But I can't conclude A because that was based on the not B, right? So any of this stuff in here, um, I just need to leave alone. Can't touch it now. Okay, um, oh, but look, I, I think we're there, right? Because, because what did we want to do? We wanted to prove this whole thing was a tautology. Um, and now I can use that CP rule because I assumed this, I concluded this, and none of the stuff that I assumed and concluded is indented, so I'm in good shape. So now this actually can be my line 9, right? So the whole thing implies B, and the reasons that I'm going to give it are, and this is interesting, watch this, it's going to be line 1 to 3, and also line 8, and this CP, right? Um, and it's just kind of in this outer blue part, I, I'm sort of assuming that, that lines 4 to 7 never happened, although I needed to use them to get here. So that's that's sort of the idea of the subproof. Let me show you this written more um, beautifully. So here it is. Um, I've written it out a little more um, neatly. Um, uh, you'll notice, by the way, that, that this is ever so slightly different from the one I did on the previous page. This, this is, is um, essentially what the book, um, what the book has. The book, the book might actually replace this stuff with QED. Um, but I, I used that lazy person's trick of assuming the anded stuff was, um, was a premise, right? So I took that and made it a premise instead of, um, you can go back and watch the other one again. What I did in the other one is I made this whole thing the premise and then split it down. So the line numbers are going to be a little bit different from the previous proof. Um, but in fact, it's kind of good to look at this because this is how it's going to look in the book, right? Though, like I said, they might put QED in there. Okay, But so you should understand my version, you should understand the book's version. Um, they are virtually the same. Um, and the most important thing here is we've got this piece in here which we can't use once we once we discharge that premise. Um, and, and so this is why I said, you know, you can use CP as long as you haven't used IP or CP before. Because um, up until this point, I didn't want you to get confused as to how you could do it. Now that you know how to use do a subproof, it's perfectly fine to use both CP and IP, or two CPs, or two IPs, or 25 CPs, and 32 IPs in your proof, as long as you're very careful about which, um, which lines you can use and which lines you can't. So here's another example from the book. They ask us to prove the converse of this implication. And hopefully you remember that the converse of an implication is you just flip the bits around, 
right? So we flip that and that. So here's actually what we're trying to prove. And this is sufficiently complicated that I, I, I'm not going to walk you through it. I'm just going to kind of show you it because what I've got in here is I actually have two subproofs. Right, so there's one piece, and then there's another piece. Right, and what you need to notice is that in my in my sub sub proof, right? So let's stop drawing on this. In my sub sub proof piece in here, right? I was still going strong, so I could use any line, right? It's like a sub block in 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 Java code block, right? I can use anything everything's in scope. Um, but once I leave this inner code block, right, and I do my IP based on lines three to six, now I'm stuck. Now I can't use, I've kind of discharged, I can't use lines three to six anymore. So it's as though these guys are gone. And so you'll see that all my reasons after that, um, I never use anything between three and six again. And the same thing happens um, when I leave this subproof, you know, think of it as this code block, I'm using an application of IP again. Um, and look at my reasoning here. My reasoning is line um, 2 and lines 7 to 9, right? And IP. So that red stuff didn't use, right? And then this stuff is sort of crossed out. Um, and so now. The only lines that remain in my proof that I can use to conclude um, my proof are just lines 1 and 10. So let me just clean this up so you can take a look at this. So here's the proof again, and this is actually a proof out of your book, so you can look in the book too. Um, but take a look at this and, you know, just pause the video, take a look at this for a minute, and make sure this kind of makes sense. You see how this is going pull out those inference rules, make sure you get it. Okay, so, you know, propositional logic, it turns out, is really useful, right? All we need to do is turn English statements into woofs, and we can prove things about how at least life should be in a logical world, right? So if I say I eat spinach or ice cream, um, and if I study logic, then I will pass the exam, right? So I'm going to let I eat spinach be S, Right, so S is I eat spinach, and I eat spinach or ice cream, I'll have I, and if I study logic, I'll use that as L, then I will pass the exam. If I eat ice cream, then I will study logic. There's a strong connection there, don't ask me why. Um, if I eat spinach, then I will go play golf. Again, don't ask me why. I failed the exam, therefore I played golf. Right, so let's just look again. Let me clean this up. So let's just look... Um, at this. So the first one says I eat spinach or ice cream, so I have S or I, right? And if I study logic, then I will pass the exam, so logic implies pass. If I eat ice cream, I will study logic. Ice cream implies logic. If I eat spinach, then I will play golf. Spinach implies golf. Um, I failed the exam, right? So I did not pass. So these are all my premises. Therefore, I played golf, right? And, you know, the question is, can you prove this, right? Um, and of course you can prove it. Though I'm going to make it even easier for you at this point and tell you that there are some derived proof rules. These are proof rules, um, exactly what the slide says, right? These are very useful rules that you can prove using the other proof rules. So if you look at that piece of paper, you'll see that these additional derived rules are also on that sheet. And from this point on, um, unless I say otherwise in an assignment, using any of these rules is fair game, right? So let's just look at um, at these rules. They just give you a little bit more um, kind of automatic stuff you can do. So there's modus tollens, right, which says, well, if A implies B, but I know that B is false, I guess A must be false as well, right? That's modus tollens and MT. Um, and there's also the proof by cases, right? So if I know that A or B is true, and I know that if A is true, C is true, and also if B is true, then C is true, but I know that A or B is true, I can conclude C, right? 
hypothetical syllogism, right? Um, this is kind of like a transitive rule. If I know A implies B, B implies C, then I can conclude A implies C. Um, and there's also constructive dilemma, um, which, which hopefully makes sense. If I know that A or B is true, right? And I know if A is true, then C is going to be true. If B is true, then D is going to be true. And I know that one of these guys is true, then I know that either C or D is going to be true. So I can conclude C or D. Um, so these are these derived proof rules, and they're just more rules you can use, right? Um, and so I'm going to show you the proof that I wanted, the thing I wanted to prove. Um, and if you recall, here, let me show you what the thing I wanted to prove was. Here you go. So, so, so um, on this page, I've got the derived rules and the regular proof rules. Um, and uh, here's the premises that we had. Right, so things like I eat spinach or ice cream. Um, if I study logic, then I will pass the exam. Remember these? So those were the things, and I wanted to be able to conclude that I play golf. I played golf, right? And the question is, um, can we fill in this proof to figure that out? And, of course, the hint is that our derived um, proof rules are going to help us. So, you know, if we look at this, um, and, I, you know, I'm trying to conclude that G. Um, so I'm going to guess, okay, it's not really a guess, but but it's a reasonable way to think about it. I'm going to guess since I need to get that G out of there, i got to come up with an S somehow. Um, and, you know, it looks like there may be one in there. Um, so I could say, well, you know, if I know that S is true, um, then I could get G with modus ponens, right? Um, and what else do I need? So how could I get S? Well, if I look again at the stuff above, if I want to get S, um, you know, the only place S appears besides there, which I'm using for my modus ponens, is this one, S or I. So if I look at my rules again and say, how can I get, um, an S out of there? Um, well, this is this is kind of an old-fashioned rule, right? This is my disjunctive syllogism. Um, if I know that not I is true, so you know I'm gonna I'm gonna guess that maybe I'm gonna have a not I in here, um, and that not I will be for some reason. But if I have that not I, then I could use the DS rule for for to get S. Um, but how am I gonna get the not I, right? Um, and and if I want the not I, let's see. Well, if you look at this, just, just kind of look at where does the I appear. Well, um, I was going to, oops, that's not right on there. Um, you know, the point of getting the not I was so that I could conclude S, um, right? You know, if we call this is like line star, and this is line star star, right? Then I can conclude S from line star and 1 using the DS rule, right? And G I'll be getting from line star star. We'll fill in what those are in a minute. And um, line 4 with modus ponens. Um, and how do I get that not I? Well, if we look around here, where, you know, we're using, huh, we're using that um, line 1 with the I to get the DS, so it's probably not going to be that one. It's probably going to be this one. So I have I implies L. Um, and if I implies L, and I look at my new rules, mostly because I told you I might be using these, right? Um, and I want a not I, so I want to conclude not I. Uh, it looks like modus tollens might help me out here, right? If I know A implies B and not B, then I can get not A. Um, so if I know the not L, then I could get the not I, right? So maybe, you know, if I say, all right, well, maybe if I got a not L here, um, then my not I, and I guess we'll call this, call this line smiley face for now, right? Then my not I would fall out from lines three and line smiley face, right? Um, and how could I get a not L? Well, again, oh, sorry, line three, and modus tollens, right? 
Um, and if I want to get this knot L, again, how do I have a knot at the bottom of something? Well, there don't seem to be any in here, but heck, she's given us an example where she said she was going to use some of these derived rules. It looks like modus tollens might work again. Um, I mean, remember, I'm never going to give you anything that you can't prove, right? Um, and it looks like if I just get the knot L, I'm golden. Um, and I think I can actually get that knot L if I just um, use modus tollens, right? Because um, I know not P from line 5, so I'll say line 5 and line 2. I guess I should put them in order. Line 5 and line 2 and modus tollens gives me not L. Um, and then it looks like my proof is done, right? So smiley face is actually going to be line 6. Why don't we fix that? Smiley face is line 6. And a single star is line 7. Let's make that look like a 7 so it looks different from my not symbol. So single star is line 7. Um, so probably this should really say 1 comma 7 in DS instead of 7 comma 1 because traditional put them in order. So star star will be line 8. The last line on my proof will be line 9. We'll make that 4 comma 8. There you go. So that's a messy version of my proof. I'll show you. Um, let me show you on the next slide the proof itself. So there you go. There's there's a pretty version of the proof um, here on the left was what I was trying to prove, and you can see I did that. I started with all the premises. Um, I concluded G. Um, so uh, I did it. Okay, one last um, topic for this lecture before I send you off to do some practice proofs. Um, which is on formal axiom systems. Um, this is not something we're going to be using, but again, it's the kind of thing that if you go out and, and you have no idea, you've never heard of these things before, um, you're going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be embarrassed. It's useful to know what the heck is a formal axiom system. So a formal axiom system is um, where you pick a set of woofs, and hopefully you pick a set of woofs that um, are sensible woofs. Um, in fact, what you really do is you pick a set of woofs that some um, uh, logician has already picked for you. Um, and those woofs are called axioms, and you always assume those are true, no matter what. Um, and then any proof that you write, the only premise you can use are your axioms. Um, and um, when you have an axiom system, not only do you specify what are your axioms, but you specify the proof rules that you can do. Um, and we have two definitions here, which are, which are actually very important, and you need to know these. So we call an axiom system sound if it only proves um, uh, theorems that are tautologies, right? So, you know, we could have lots of axiom systems, like we could assume that A and not A are always true, but that's not going to give us a bunch of things that, 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 um, are, uh, that are sound, right? Um, so it's sound if anything that you can prove is always true, right, is a tautology, and it's complete if you can actually prove everything, right? So just because it's sound doesn't mean you can prove everything, but if it's complete, then you can indeed prove all tautologies as theorems, right? And again, just remember, right, the last wolf in our proof is our theorem. That's what we're proving. So there are a bunch of um, axiom systems. This one is called the frege lukasiewicz I think that's how you say it. I could be very wrong. Axiom system. Um, and it turns out that if you just have these three axioms and modus ponens, you can prove anything. Um, it is sound and it is complete. Um, uh, Typically, the way you do these in real life is you take your axiom system, and the first thing that you do is you um, prove some of the other proof rules so that then you can um, use all the rules rather than just one. But so um, let's show you just one example. So you're going to either have to look in the book to see what the um, axioms are or kind of go back and, and or look at the slides, right? Perhaps you actually downloaded the slides. Um, 
uh, but you can see the actual Axiom 1 um, in the, hopefully it's called Frege Lukasiewicz Axiom System. Axiom 1, um, if you look at it on the previous page, it reads as A implies B implies A, um, and of course you can replace uh, each of these um, letters with a different a different letter, so you can see that I've replaced or with a wolf, right? So I've replaced B with this piece. So that is in fact axiom one, um, and you can see this is also a use of axiom one, um, and axiom two is a mess that you can look up, but just trust me, this this whole thing here is in fact. Um, an instantiation of axiom two, um, and if you know this and you know this, right? Well, notice that this first piece here is in fact that piece. So, hooray for modus ponens! We can conclude the second half, which is what we got here. And again, um, axiom one gives us this piece as we saw, and so if we know that, plus this whole big thing, well, now we know the front of the big thing is true, right? Which means, of course, modus ponens um, can give us that A implies A. QED. So we have proved, or proven, that A implies A. Um, not necessarily something you want to do a lot of in your spare time. We're not going to do any problems with this. But I just wanted you to have some feel of what a formal axiom system is and, and how you might do a proof with it.